or you can have collective bargaining for a minimal amount, and you want to work. But to complement collective bargaining, you must have feasible market. As Dick said here a moment ago, you've got low collective volume, you've got a very mediocre bargaining and marketing growth. You increase here, you increase here. And it's their shift as well. Always keeping in mind that the inventory, the available supply in the hands of the bargainer is the only way to enhance the marketing and bargaining posture. That's really what I needed to say, Jerry. I don't want to take up all of your meeting, but it's dang important for you men as delegates, if you are in a feeder cattle producing area, to quit bargaining with the bargain. Please. Produce with the producer. That's all you need to do. The rest of your team is simply sitting on the sideline waiting to be called in to your market. Not a good. Thank you, Jeff. more can I say? You took my whole speech. <laughs> now I'm uh, really pleased to be here and to have the opportunity to present to you gentlemen and ladies here this afternoon the feeder cattle program. First of all, looking around this afternoon, I see a lot of you that are familiar faces and I realize that a lot of you have travel great distances in order to be here. And I'm sure a lot of you have left a lot of things at home that were important to you that you could be doing at this time. But you're here, and that means to me that you are interested and you have made a commitment to see the feeder cattle program work within your area. My commitment for this 1981 convention is that no one leave here without the knowledge to answer the questions in your area and without the understanding to make the program work in your area if that's your desire. The feeder cattle program began as did the organization on simply an idea. That was collective bargaining. And we've proved that collective bargaining works in agriculture. You know, I think sometimes that the only problem we have is that maybe we don't truly understand and believe in the power of collective bargaining ourselves we haven't seemed to get the point across to our fellow producers. But I can assure you that the power of collective bargaining is real. The industry, labor, have all picked up on collective bargaining simply because we showed them, we proved to them that it did work. And they have used it in their programs and made it work for them. You hear every day on the radio and read in the newspaper of labor or industry using collective bargaining to reach their goals. We come up with it first and then we back off of it. We've got to definitely get back to collective bargaining and not just marketing. I think we have put together in the feeder cattle division, a staff now that is second to none. We have got representatives from both the marketing and the producing side of the industry and have molded them together into a team to best serve you guys, the producers. That's not their only job. 
They are also to serve as a communication link between you as a seller and the buyers, the collection point blockers, the collection point staff itself, the county meet committees. It's very important that they get this job done. We've set up a line of meetings that will include five to six collection points to the meeting to better keep you informed. We've asked that the blockers, the collection point boards, the meet committees try to attend these meetings and become informed of what's going on in your area. You know, I can imagine there's not a much more embarrassing spot to be in than maybe to be a county meet chairman and attend your county meeting and get asked for a report and not know what's going on. It can be done with a simple telephone call into the office to find out, and if you don't have a watt line number, get it and give us a call. It is imperative that you all stay involved in the program personally. You know, I'm not trying to ask you for three, four days a week and get nothing out of it. When we first started the organization, a lot of us worked this thing day after day for nothing. And it worked better than it's working with trying to run it with full-time staff. You have got to personally stay involved. At the time, full-time staff become responsible for every aspect of your feeder cattle program, it will no longer be your feeder cattle program. Do you understand what I'm saying? The co-ops, many of them started the same way. You may have been a member. Everything was set up so that you would be totally involved. But when you quit being involved and somebody else had to carry the ball, then you were out of it. It was no longer your program nor it was no longer your business. Somebody else was running it. You've got to stay involved. I'd like to take just a minute here to talk about inventory. I just can't bring a word to my mind to explain to you the importance of the inventory to your negotiators. There just is not one. They can do nothing without your inventory. It is the only thing they have to work with. Probably most of you are producers and sellers and don't do a lot of buying of backgrounded cattle or of stalker cattle. So I'd like to make a little example to you that maybe you can a little better understand what I'm talking about. And I want you to know that in my last meeting here, I had two guys sitting right back there side by side on the back row who buy feeders from us consistently and feed them out. And when I got through, they were both smiling. Let's say you want to buy a, a new car. And you go down to your car dealer, and he doesn't have what you want, so you order a car. And you haul your parents around, or you haul your children around, or you haul your in-laws around. And you, so you need a four-door car to make it a little easier to get in and out. And you'd like to get a blue car. And you'd like it to have a white vinyl roof so it would be a little cooler in the summer. And you want a V8 engine. So that's what you order, and you go back home. And a couple of months later, because I understand it takes at least that long now, you get a call and your car is in. So you go down to pick it up, and it's green, and it doesn't have a vinyl roof, and it's only got two doors, and it's a six-cylinder. There's no doubt in my mind you're going to turn around and walk off and say, I don't believe that's the car that I ordered. This is where I got my smiles from the two feeders. I said, you guys may think that's a little bit steep, and you may think that's pushing this thing a little bit far as an example, but I can tell you it's not. You see, the way the 
economic trend is going, I think you all understand everybody has gotten pretty much refined as to exactly what they do in their operation. And if you're a backgrounder and get in calves weighing three to six hundred pounds, the three hundred ones are all right, but the six hundreds is where you're planning on selling them when you got through backgrounding them, and they're not going to do you any good, and you're not going to keep them. I think you're all aware that the crossbred calves will bring a couple bucks a hundred more than the straight breads, and the exotic crossbreds will probably bring two hundred two bucks a hundred more than them. So you're looking at a situation where the feeder or the backgrounder gets in a set of three to six hundred pound calves, he's going to be just like you would be on the car. He's going to turn them down. That's not what he ordered. And you see, I've only got one way of knowing what you've got, and that's from the inventory that you turn in to me and the negotiators. There's nothing wrong with the three to six hundred pound calves if we know they're there. We've got orders for calves plumbed down to 200 pounds. We've got feeders who will buy the calves, the exotic calves coming out of the West that's weighing seven and a quarter. Still balling, short tail calves right off the cow, but they're weighing seven and a quarter. And we've got guys that'll buy them and like them. But for one of them to hit a backgrounder is, you know, it's a catastrophe. He's got no use whatsoever for it. That's why your inventory is so important. There's no way that we can sell what you have to sell unless we know you've got it to sell. I want to spend just a minute now going through a regular collection point run. I want to kind of get right down to the logistics of this thing. If there's anything that somebody don't understand, I want to get it cleared up. The first thing we need is what we've been talking about in inventory. We try to price the cattle then approximately 36 hours ahead of the way up. In other words, example, we'd price a Monday evening for a Wednesday way up. Tuesday for Thursday, Wednesday for Friday way up, and so on. Now I need, as soon as the pricing meeting is held, a call back again, either immediately after the meeting or early the next morning as soon as possible, because we're right back to that old word inventory again. We understand that off of the pricing card. Somebody may decide not to go. Somebody who'd listed half of his cattle may have decided to bring them all. So your inventory is subject to change. But we need that inventory back again so that the buyer may get his transportation lined up and to give your negotiators just a little bit more time to do some backpedaling or some running forward or whatever they need to do with the buyer on the new inventory lineup. Now, after we know what the inventory is and we've got the buyer all set up and delivery day comes, I want the cattle in to the point as early as possible for two or three reasons. Number one, we have 11 full-time graders and sorters or feeder cattle specialists, as we call them, working for the feeder cattle division. They don't have time to spend two days at a given collection point taking in 150 or 60 head of cattle. Now, if you're talking about running so many cattle that you just can't physically get them all delivered in one day, I'll certainly use that, stand that as an excuse. And you can't afford to pay them to spend that time at a collection point to take in that number of head of cattle. So we get the cattle in, get them weighed, and get out and get on the road and get the next one weighed, and we'll see you again next week. The other problem you run into, I run into it in Minnesota last week. I had cattle come into the point at 5.30 in the evening, 
and my man attempted to sort them and grade them with a flashlight. You know, that's a little bit uncalled for, and it's not going to happen anymore. We're going back to anything that's not in by 12 o'clock noon is going to have a buck a hundred pulled off of it automatically. You just well expect it. There's two reasons why that might not happen. Number one, your trucks broke down between your loading point and your delivery point or stuck. Or you've got so many cattle you can't run them all in one day. Or maybe we're running two collection points in one day to try to get the kind of volume to make the right kind of loads of cattle so you can get them moved. Those things you would be notified of, of course, in advance. We do that consistently in the Missouri area. We run two points a day on purpose to make better loads of cattle to move out with. So you could run into that occasionally, but we have to get the cattle in in time. We're not a feedlot. We don't hold cattle overnight and feed them. Most of the collection points don't have the facilities to hold cattle overnight and feed and water them. And if you do get caught for some reason and have to hold them overnight and can't feed and water them, I'll guarantee you you're in trouble immediately. So it is important that we get them in early, that we have the inventory, so we can move your production as it needs to be moved. Now on direct ships, there's not a whole lot to talk about. As far as inventory, of course, it's the same situation. We will try to get a feeder cattle man out to look at your cattle if you've called in for a direct ship. Then we will negotiate a price with you on the cattle or negotiate a price with a buyer and get back to you on the cattle. Then again, your cattle will be either brought to a point and sorted, weighed, and graded, or maybe weighed on the truck if the sale is made that way. If that's the way you feel you need the sale made, it can be done. Then again, as in the regular collection point run, you're paid immediately after we have received your cattle. Now, the purest form of collective bargaining that we use in the feeder cattle division is no doubt forward contracting. Forward contracting goes hand in hand with collective bargaining. On our forward contracts, I do want to explain one thing to you. Dick mentioned the grain situation years back. To keep those kind of situations from arising again, I've got to have your filled out signed contracts in my hands or the negotiator's hands in the office before I can sell your cattle. So it's best that you try to send a copy direct to me. It's okay to turn them in to your feeder reps in your area, but many times those people get busy and they get short stopped and it's two or three days late getting in. And the way the market conditions have been over the past year, I've seen times when 24 hours could have meant three bucks a hundred. So it's best that you get your inventory down early and get it mailed in early so we know what you have to sell. Forward contracting must be started early in the year. Any cattle not sold by at least August 1 are probably in for a rough time. Your buyers all understand what happens in the western area when it starts getting late in the fall. And if those cattle aren't sold by August 1, why should they jump in and start giving big money for calves? They can set another 30 days and wait for the first storm and buy them at whatever they want to buy them at. That's about the size of it. And most of them have been in this thing longer than a lot of us have and know the situation. They 
read us like a book. There are several different ways that you can get involved in forward contracting. I want to go over here to the blackboard a minute and explain to you at least one way that you might be able to work the program in your area. And it's called starting with a power block. We've tried several times to let the producers sign up their production like 10% at a time, and it doesn't work. You'll all agree with me in the meeting that you'd like to deliver the right kind of calves to each buyer as he accepts his contracts, but when you contract and build a market, Consequently, the first bunch you sold is probably cheaper considerably than the last bunch. You tend to want to put all your light calves and dinks on the cheap contract and your good heavy ones on the high-priced one. Now, that makes sense. I understand that. That's business. But it doesn't work that way. Because that guy who gave 60 cents on the first block, you know, that may have took more guts for that man to do that than it did that last man to give you 85 cents on that last 10% of that block if you already had the market turned around and moving up. So it's only fair that they all get treated alike. So on what I'm going to show you here, it would be arranged through your collection point man or your meat rep, whatever it might happen to be who handles your program in your area, to actually pick the bunches to be delivered at certain delivery dates. Now, you may sell this block over a month or two months period of time, but it would still be for like the same week delivery on all the cattle. What this would amount to is you can use this as an individual's production or as an entire collection point production within a state. But whatever you start setting up your blocks of cattle, collection points or individuals within a collection point area, and you put each one of them's production into the block. You keep building your block, and let's say right now a 500 pound choice steer calf is worth 65 cents. So you've got 65 cents here. And you build your block and you may tell John Doe buyer that if he'd be interested in buying a block of calves from you that you could guarantee him in two weeks or 30 days if he needs more calves that you can fill his order again and by whatever means you might use, you push the market and say you sell a block off of that and your next one you get sold at 66. Well, if the going market's been 65, and let's say this is a collection point and you've got eight producers' cattle in that block that you just sold, if eight of you out of the same area just sold your calves for 66 cents, to your neighbors, the market in the area is no longer 65, is it? It's 66. We're going to get into that in a minute. Because that also causes you problems. But that's establishing a floor price also. So you've established a floor price at 66. <coughs> So the man comes back to you or you find another buyer in need of cattle and you sell the next block at 68 and you stair step your program right on up. That's how it's been done every time in the past and it's worked for you. You've got cost of production several times in the past but we drop the ball. We become uncontractable because we get up here to a figure that is our cost of production plus a profit. And instead of forward contracting on out down the road six months ahead, a year ahead, a year and a half ahead, at our cost of production plus a profit, it's more fun just to try to keep going. Now you've got a little 
thing up here above this cost of production plus a profit, that's a margin for the finished product. And you've got that in raw oil, in timber, in beef, in anything you want to talk about. You've got a margin in there for labor and somebody else to make their profit on it, whether you like it or not. So we keep squeezing this thing up, and this thing has to keep going ahead until pretty soon you reach a point of saturation. Regardless of what it be, whether it be the packer, whether it be the chain store, whether it be Mrs. Consumer, or whether it just be simply our own greed to keep it going as long as we can, somewhere you reach a point of saturation. And when you do, you're in trouble. Because whenever you pass that and somebody says that's enough, and they pull five bucks off the market in a day or two's time, you know what happens? You dump on them because all this time that this was happening, you wouldn't sell. You never did. 10% of you did. The other 90% of you hang on and wait for it to get to the top. So when it breaks that $5, you say, uh oh, I may be in trouble, but we may have waited too long. And here they all come. They're not on the block, but they start dumping in on this market. And as they dump in and run, it comes down just like it went up. Only usually a little faster. There's no way to catch it. It comes right back down to the bottom. And the only way to get it back up there is start the program over again, just exactly like you've done it the first time. You get in more trouble by contracting every other year than if you'd have never contracted at all. You know what happened to fat cattle? Here a few years back, we had what they called a ceiling on the beef prices. They couldn't pay over the ceiling as far as the chain stores or the packers were concerned for the beef. And we weren't totally the only one at fault in the thing. The packers had a little fun out of it too. I was working fat cattle at that time. And the buyers from the East Coast or wherever was coming into the packers with suitcases full of cash because, of course, it was black market beef. And there was no way the prices they were getting for it were legal, so they had to pay cash for it. And they kept pushing it and pumping them up until they finally got all they could take. And they said, listen, you're having your fun now, but you never have stuck together. And one of these days you're going to drop the ball, and when you do, we're going to get you and we're going to get even. And you know, that's been four or five years ago, and you're still suffering from it. Now, I'm not saying that's necessary, and I'm not saying that that shouldn't have been done. All I'm saying is we did drop the ball. They're organized. Sure, you can catch organization occasionally and get them in a bad position and force something like this on them. But if you'll stay organized, you've got a much better chance. See the position they're back in today and the position that we're back in today. And that's what happens when you push the thing up and go over the top and don't stay organized. So your forward contracting every other year throws you in exactly that same position. You have your fun on the year that you build it up and push it way up past cost of production plus a profit. But they're going to come back if you don't stay organized and get even with you for four or five years in a row and it just actually puts more of a yo-yo effect on the market rather than helping straighten the market out for you. I want to show you a little slide of what collective bargaining has done for you in the past, proof of it. This 
this was put together off of the Montana block because we do do a lot more contracting out there and the figures are more readily available to me out of there. But down here is where we started our initial NFO contracting and blocking programs in the state of Montana. These are USDA government figures on four to 500 pound steer calves based on the Kansas City market. You see, Montana, Utah, and those northwestern states rule these markets. If they will start contracting and get a large percentage of their calves contracted early in the year, and the buyers realize that there's going to be no flood of calves forced in by early winter storms, your prices will hold. If they realize that these calves are all there to be dumped, whenever the bad weather hits, then your markets everywhere are going to suffer. So we started and everybody with a lot of enthusiasm contracted every year and you built your program up to the 1973 level. In 1973, in the spring and summer, we held meetings in Colorado and in Montana with an unheard of price of 83 to 84 five cents on feeder cattle. Never been anything within $30 of that before in history. And we run into the same thing that Walt mentioned up here a while ago. It was too good to be true at that time over your cost of production plus a profit. But those guys that didn't want to see your calves move out of the area told you if you'd hang on, you'd get a dollar come fall. So what'd we do? we become uncontractable. We didn't contract them. We hung on. We held them back, and we got an oversupply of calves, and the bottom fell out of it. And when you do that, you all get down, and it takes a year or two to get you enthused enough again to get back into contracting and get started. But as soon as you start again, the market starts to do something. And we work up to 1979. And we block and we contract and we get calves up to as much as $1.08 on some of the western calves. And because of that, the following year, 95 isn't enough. So we all get uncontractable once more. And again, we lose our market. We haven't got that completed. I don't particularly even want to see it. It's going to be right down in there somewhere. We're urging you now to block and contract yearling calves for spring. You're setting in the position where all the financial institutions feel that interest will increase again in the spring. You're probably looking now at prices for spring delivery on yearlings that will probably be a dollar, maybe two dollars under what a 700 pound calf would currently bring. The main reason for that is these light yearling calves are very scarce to find right now. But come spring, all these fall calves will be yearlings and there will be a lot of yearlings around. And with the interest rates staring the guys in the face, it's not going to be, I don't feel, a very good situation. I recommend that if we can get the dollar or two under today's market for them, we get them contracted and get them sold. We need all of your help. There's no way that I or what staff I have can totally put your program together for you in the country. We need each one of you's help personally, and I'm asking you all to keep in contact with us. We'll keep in contact with you as best we can, and let's put our feeder cattle program together, and let's make it fly. I know together we can all do it. We've done it in the past, and we can do it again. This time, let's lock her in and keep her there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, sir.
That is that is not always true. Uh, it depends a lot, you know, on your buyer and the arrangements you've made in the first place. In the winter months, when we set a price, we try to take these things into consideration. Uh, a lot of times there will be forecasting bad weather whenever we set a price, and we will talk with our buyer and say, you know, if we get into bad weather and can't deliver on Wednesday, can we go ahead with this for Thursday or Friday at the same price? Now, of course, you know, you're setting on the same situation that you are with a day and a half ahead pricing for your pricing meeting. Mm -hmm. The point is, the day you say, yes, I'll sell my cattle at that price, that's when the sale is made. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with what, whether the price is $2 up or $2 down on delivery day. Yes, the sale was made the time. If your buyer agrees to go ahead and stay with that price, then we don't change the price or reprice. Well, see, we try to go like on Tuesday to make the sale. I told the person the next day to get around that big truck day mm -hmm. and you can get in on the first. We don't try to say on Wednesday night, now we made the sale tonight, we've got to have a sale. Well, he didn't even get time to go home from the meeting. He can run it all night long. And even on the big truck day, he may be still trying to go to that. That gives you the next day to line up. And right. During that time, the weather may come up and fight. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. Right. I understand what you're saying. It depends. It depends on the market situation at the time. You know, we feel the same way. If if you do run into these extremes and it looks like it'd be two or three days before you could possibly move cattle, I think it's best both interested parties if the thing is repriced and redone. There's as many times that it will be in your favor as there is times that it will be against you. It's like I say, it's just like your day and a half ahead pricing. I think in the long run, the day you deliver you'll have a better price than the market just as many times as the market will be lower or higher than the price you've got. But anyway, like I say, a guy's got to base it back to the whenever he made the decision that the cattle were going to move. Yes? There, a lot of them are going direct. Uh, predominantly all the Missouri cattle. Uh, probably close to half of the Montana cattle. Eighty percent of the Nebraska cattle uh, would be going direct. There's some other areas too that we move direct cattle out of. Of course, we'll move direct cattle out of any area as long as we've got the inventory to know what we've got. Of course, we've got some spots where I guess the gentleman was sitting in the other meeting that brought up, he's out of that southeastern corner of Nebraska, and he said he had a lot of producers with 10, 15, uh, you know, 18, 20 head. And, of course, two of them wanted to go day before yesterday, and three of them don't want to go till next week, so when he gets it right down to it, he can't get over about 30 head together at a time. That's a tough situation. I, it happens in the area where he is, we have a full-time man who is half feeder cattle and half fat cattle because there is quite a few fats in the area. He does get a lot of those little bunches of cattle moved off to local buyers, but that's a tough situation right now to handle. Uh, those little bunches of cattle where you can't get enough of them put together to make a block. I suggested to him that he talk to two or three of them points around close there to him because Pawnee and Friend and Syracuse and several of those points are in eastern Nebraska are close together and run it like we do the Missouri program. Run two of the points or all three of the points on the same day and make a load or two of cattle out of the situation. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Any other questions? Yes. That, I'll tell you what has got to be done in that situation. That, as far as I'm concerned, is totally a lack of communication between us and our blocker and you guys as members out there. That particular area, I've never got an inventory out of. You've got, excuse the expression, but you've got the chicken and the egg situation. Somewhere down along the line, somebody felt they got a bad deal there. So a buyer doesn't want to give the very tip top of the market card for 300 to 1,000 pound cattle, beef, crossbreds, and Holsteins all in the same run and get one pot load so it's tough to get the best card in the world out of him. So I understand the guys that's got the strings of good cattle will not come in at that card. I understand that. So you've got a chicken or the egg deal. Now we started motley Minnesota running with the hope of breaking that situation up. Sure. So he gets his authority to sell them, and he gets maybe 200 head from this producer. And we run into bad weather, but as quick as he sold them this, for this producer, he said, well, I don't know if I sold it too cheap or not, but I miss you from what the market done last week. He grabs his newspaper, maybe calls me back, and gets what information he can quickly. And then shall go. So he goes, and he's all lined up for the sale. He might even go to the sale barn out there and talk to him after he gets through with it. And then when we can't deliver those uh, cattle because of the weather, that breaks that contract. He's not as important as others. We let him go. But then if, if that, that, uh, that sale barn man might tell him, take those cattle, bring the old that's, that's pretty cheap. They're going to bring it. I know they're bringing it all in on that. But you don't put a floor on it. Right. And then he gets them all in there in the sale barn. He's getting what is it, 50% of them. He might get a dollar more than they get a dollar and a half. So the average value may be what's going But you can't tell him that. See, we've got right. Yeah. Well, there's nothing really that you can do about that on a storm market. The only thing I can say, if it wasn't so bad that he couldn't go to the barn or somewhere with him, then it shouldn't have been so bad he couldn't have come to the point with him. And the way up probably shouldn't have been called off. But I think you're going to see a big change in this thing this year is why I'm up here more or less pleading with all you people this afternoon to help in this thing. I talk to a ton of dealers and buyers all through this year and all of them was in the same situation. These barns out here were quoting 70 bucks when the markets and the cattle were bringing 67, 68 and even less. The guys were dropping their direct buyers that they'd always sold to, including us, and going to the barn for the big buck and didn't get it. Got even less than we bid them in hundreds of cases and less than their local dealers were bidding them in hundreds of cases and I think we stand a chance of seeing this thing turn around and twice as many cattle being bought direct out of the country this year as there was this past year and I just think if we're in there doing our part that knowing what they're going to get for the cattle before they sell them a day and a half before they have to weigh them up is going to be enough and an advantage to them in their mind that they're going to move the cattle our way if we'll just go talk to them 
and let them know what we can do. I really believe that. Do I have any?